attending, attending our presentation um, on Rethinking I-94, a new approach to historic contexts. Um, we'll start with some team introductions here. I'm Rachel Peterson. I'm one of the principals and co-owners of Hess Royce & Company. We're a private consulting firm in Minneapolis. We've also got my business partner, Elizabeth Gales, here, um, one of the other principals at Hess Royce, along with Katie Hanskering and Maggie Jones from the Minnesota Department of Transportation's Cultural Resources Unit. So just for a brief agenda today, um, we're going to talk through what this Rethinking I-94 project was, um, what the goal was of this mammoth historic context um, that we built for this project was, what the study parameters were, how we organized all of this information and then talk through a couple of case studies on some of the interesting research we did to kind of uh, wet your palates for when the historic context goes live. So with that, I will hand it over. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Great, I'm Katie Honskering. I am a supervisor with the Cultural Resources Unit at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. How many of you have heard of the Rethinking I-94 project? Oh, actually, that's great. I will let the Metro District Communications team know they're doing a good job. Um, so the Rethinking I-94 project. MnDOT is interested in, prove, in improving a portion of I-94 in the Twin Cities Metro. It extends from downtown St. Paul up through the intersection and the junction of Trunk Highway 55, 35W, that sort of messy bit right over the river. The project goals from a MnDOT perspective include enhancing safety for people and goods, improving mobility for people and goods, addressing the aging infrastructure within the corridor, and supporting the transportation initiatives that are consistent with the state and regional council plans. We have to think about the history of the construction of I-94. Right? It's an urban area. It was constructed in the 1960s. It went, it was decidedly gone through uh, communities of color and basically destroyed them. And so as part of this project, we have to think about that past and think about what are the solutions for the future. So the Federal Highway Administration has uh, developed in, well, they're in the process of developing what's called an environmental impact statement. So it's an EIS NEPA process. How many of you are familiar with the NEPA process? Excellent. Actually, a lot of people. That's great. Um, so it's a, it's a tiered environmental impact statement, which means they, right now, at this moment, MnDOT is gathering information and looking at a wide breadth of potential possibilities for this corridor. Different types of transit, just ways to improve the structural stability of the corridor, thinking about you know, walking, biking, mobility, taking all of those pieces into, into consideration before they specifically choose an alternative. And that alternative is a project-specific action. That process, the EIS process, is a many, many multiple year process, right? They don't think they're gonna have a record of decision until I think 2027. So it's gonna be a long time to make the decisions because there's a lot of information gathering, a lot of public involvement, public engagement. So it makes it tricky for historians to do work, right? On a review and compliance perspective, the Section 106 perspective, we're responding directly to what the project is. But we don't know what the project is right now. There isn't actually a project. We just have some ideas of what maybe could happen in the corridor. So what do we do as historians in this situation? We decided, our group, our unit decided, we're gonna start with developing a historic context of, a, of the study area. And we're gonna talk, Liz is gonna talk a little bit about what the study area is. So knowing what the NEPA document is, knowing what our, the timeline for everything is, we, we decided to really start embarking on development of a historic context of this area. So MnDOT hired uh, Hess Rice and Company and a couple of other consultants to start developing that, that history. Our goals for the context were to understand the project corridor and history, to be able to utilize this document in the future, so thinking ahead, you know, 
10 years, 15 years? How can we develop a history of this area that's gonna be useful for historians in the future? We also really wanted to focus on community content. So we did a lot of public engagement, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in the future too. But most importantly, like Senator Friends mentioned earlier, we wanted to tell the whole story here. We didn't want to just talk about transportation because it's really easy for us to do. We're a transportation agency. We're doing transportation-related improvements. We could have just stopped our context at transportation, talking about the history of the development of I-94. But we didn't want to do that. We wanted to tell the entire story because, at, like Senator Friends mentioned, it's a service to us all. We wanted to tell the good, we wanted to tell the bad. We wanted to tell the whole thing. So we looked at multiple aspects, not just transportation. We, talk, we looked at different themes, like um, entertainment and recreation along the corridor. What was here before the transportation system was in place? We wanted to talk about um, the history of the black community here. We wanted to talk about the history of urban American Indians in this corridor. We also wanted to tell the story of the individual neighborhoods for which 94 passes through. And we didn't just want to do it for the neighborhood for just a piece of that. We want to tell the whole story of that neighborhood. How it was developed, the changes of that neighborhood over time. This really robust, really comprehensive, really full historic context. As a result of, of that work, the context that will be ultimately posted on the Metro District's website here in the next month is our most comprehensive, robust, and largest effort ever for the Cultural Resources Unit. And we did that intentionally so we could utilize this, this context in the future that we could potentially solve for you know, questions about project development in the future, but also to give the communities along the corridor a really good history that they can use in the future, and I'll talk about that later. All right, we're gonna move on to how we set the boundaries for the context. So we were given this project without having really any idea what it's going to include. Um, we were just given a broad area from the Capitol to Trunk Highway 55 and a study area that went from University to Marshall Avenue, which is about a half mile wide. And so it's a very large area that's very densely populated. Um, so that was our geographic boundaries for this project, because we needed to have some, not knowing uh, exactly what the project's going to include. Um, because we don't know when it's going to be built either, uh, we decided to go broad uh, time period wise. And so we asked um, within our scope of work, or request for proposal to consultants, we asked uh, for the context to go up to the present day. Um, not necessarily getting into the details of uh, all development that's happened since uh, like 1990 through today, because that is be beyond that 45 year sort of range that we often look at, but we wanted to capture those large themes. Uh, anything that would be defining for these neighborhoods that happened in that time, because it could be extraordinarily significant or um, there's a number of things that happened closer to the present day that we wanted to capture as well. And so we, we asked the consultant team to look to the present day for that. We also wanted to focus on public engagement and public outreach. Um, there are many different community groups and um, neighborhoods that have a ton of information. And so we, we reached out to those groups. The consultant team reached out to them and conducted um, 14 interviews with different groups. So I believe we talked to the Minneapolis um, Indian Affairs uh, Commissioner Council, and then we also talked to several Rondo uh, residents and uh, quite a few other individuals that provided some great information. We're able to capture those interviews and we have them recorded for future reference as well. Uh, we also set up a uh, survey online for people to provide information on what they knew about the quarter, what was historic to them, what is something that we should be considering within this larger context. And so we really wanted to do a robust 
public engagement and public outreach right at the forefront so something doesn't come in later on that we didn't even consider. We wanted to capture it all right away. Um, and one of the ways we, we planned all of this was through the having a literature search and research design to look at um, how how we should be looking at this corridor. There's so many areas of history, so many uh, neighborhoods. How should we even be thinking about this and plan this, what ended up being in a, th a thousand page context? And so those were some of the broad boundaries we provided with the consultant team. And then they, they ran with it from there. Nice. So good morning. Um, so I know we've, we've talked a lot about broad, um, <laughs> the broad thing. So we have this helpful caterpillar up on the screen for you guys to look at. So um, as we've said, this was the study area about a half mile crossing over the actual interstate itself. So it includes portions of Minneapolis. So there's nothing like saying, you know, the west side of Minneapolis, no, no. Well, it's actually the east side of Minneapolis, but it's the west side of the study area. There was a lot of um, terminology that we had to adopt uh, when we went through this. I wanna call out really quickly um, our other team members who um, are not necessarily with us today. So besides Hess Royce and Company, we also had Mead and Hunt as a subconsultant to Hess Royce. Hess Royce was the prime. Uh, Zan Associates for public engagement. And then land relations with uh, Dr. Dr. Margaret McHugh Enzer, who was our ethnographer. And um, MnDOT very wisely um, required an ethnographer to be on the team for this study. Um, so when we looked at this, uh, Katie and, and Maggie have talked about, you know, the, start, started talking about some of the scope of what we had, but I'll tell you right away, we got the contract and I was like, oh my gosh, what have we done? Because <laughs> um, this, is, this is going to be huge. And we knew that um, MnDOT was, uh, that CRU was working to change the way that we approach this. And so you're initially overwhelmed and then there's the analogy about how do you eat a whale? You eat it bite by bite. And so um, we, we looked at it and initially we were thinking, I, I, no, I thought, oh gosh, we're gonna have to talk about all of the history of all of Minneapolis and all of St. Paul. And then Rachel, who will be talking in a little bit about the architecture and structure of this actual context, she was like, no, no, we don't actually have to talk about all that. We have to really confine it to this actual study area. Who is living in the study area? Who, historically, who is living there now? Um, MnDOT, in an earlier phase of the I-94 project, worked with the 106 group to do um, a study of cultural groups within the area. That is available on the I-94 website. It is a really great resource if anybody's interested in checking it out. They interviewed and reached out to a lot of community members. Um, so we were building on that foundation. Um, we also recognized that there were um, many diverse communities, um, especially people of color in this, this area, and that their histories have long been overlooked, especially by government agencies. And so we felt especially charged to um, try to do the best that we could to cover their stories. We got this contract in the summer of 2020. We put our proposal in just as things were starting to lock down. Um, and there, will, there should probably be a, an entirely different presentation about public engagement and how Zan Associates had to pivot once it became clear that meeting in person with, with community members was not going to happen for quite a while. And so how do we set up the interviews? Um, you know, we were, if you, I know we don't want to think about this, but if you remember, we were all still trying to figure out how do we engage, when will we get to see each other, when will it be safe? Um, so that really, um, that, that kind of really changed, but I don't want to steal Zan's thunder and hopefully maybe next year or in a future conference they can talk about everything that they've done. I should mention that their engagement is still occurring on this project and they're now entering a new phase, um, which we can talk about more towards the end. Um, so actual documentation. So we, you've seen the, the, the caterpillar. What did we do? Well, the first thing we did is we literally drove all around this entire study area just to take in the physical built environment. What are you seeing? You are seeing some high density, high rise um, apartment buildings and condo buildings. You are seeing a lot of different types of neighborhoods. 
in both Minneapolis and in St. Paul. Okay, check, check. So physical stuff, we're seeing these tall, dense buildings. We're also seeing a lot of single family houses. We're seeing a lot of commercial buildings. We're seeing Allianz Field. We're seeing universe, parts of the University of Minnesota. Augsburg, I mean, you know, all of this is, is within our study area. Um, after we did the drive around and then realized, okay, what are neighborhood boundaries? We called up the most recent stuff. Man, uh, to the leaders of the Minneapolis and St. Paul, why do you keep changing the boundaries of your neighborhood? <laughs> uh, um, and I understand things change, but I'm like, could you, could you write down that? And then in this year, we decided we were going to recast the boundaries and claim two more blocks from this neighborhood and change the name completely to something that nobody had an idea about. Um, so actually getting a handle on the neighborhood histories was slightly more challenging than we thought it would be because they have morphed over time. Um, and then in addition to that, as the start of what we were going to be doing for our literature review and research design, we looked at all previous historic contexts that we could find that were, were developed by different studies over the years for this area. Um, I really want to give a shout out to Sebastian Renfield, who started this project working for Mead and Hunt, and then we've been very fortunate that he came to work with us at Hess Royce. And um, he uses GIS data in a really great way for, for historic. And as you can see in this map that has the, the red dots in it, those red dots all represent previously inventoried properties in the study area. You're going to see collections around, um, in this case, Snelling Avenue. If you were to go further west, you would see Prospect Park, which is a designated historic district, and it's just lit up very densely red. But you will also notice that there is not a lot of survey from about Lexington until you start getting closer to the capital, and that is the historic area of Rondo. So that is an area that we have long overlooked. And so that is something that CRU rightly called out as something that they want to try to do better and improve upon and help to recognize the history. So the literal previous information showed to us where there were some gaps in study that we were going to need to focus on. Um, in addition to that, the first thing that, that had to happen um, before we could even start writing the context is we needed to come up with a research design. So what are the research questions that we're going to answer? Katie mentioned transportation. Obviously, okay, yeah, we have lots of questions about transportation, but not only the, the interstate, um, but what happened before the interstate? What about all the railroads that went through this area? What about the streetcar system? What about the highways? What about the paths that potentially um, American Indian communities used before Euro-American settlement? These are all things that you start to think about this and more questions come. So some questions were a little bit more obvious than others. Uh, and then as we started to look at the literature review, so I mentioned the previous studies, but then starting to look at where, what are the newspapers, what are the community newspapers out there that we should be looking at? Um, you start to get more questions about, um, you know, yes, obviously, we, um, Rondo, Reconnect Rondo, for example, RCR has been very good about speaking up for the community as of our other members, so we, we knew Rondo was going to be an important focus, and we had questions about that, but we also were like, what about Hmong community? A, a more recent group to this area, but there are also Hmong residents in this area. What about urban American Indian population in Minneapolis? Our area touches onto Franklin Avenue uh, in the uh, urban American uh, Indian cultural um, corridor in the city of Minneapolis. So the research design helped us to start focusing our structure. It was something that we knew would probably morph and change over time as we did research um, and as we started to draft, but it was a very good framework. And CRU um, had to review and approve that before we could even start drafting the context itself. Same thing with the literature review. Um, it is a very long list of all the newspapers, the websites, um, secondary sources like histories written about the cities, about neighborhoods, about cultural groups, journal articles. We tried to gather as much as we could, but recognizing it was a starting point. And all of this information is included in the front sort of piece at the beginning of our context to help show where we started from. So I'm going to have Rachel uh, talk next about the, the structure of everything that is going on inside.
So I hope it's come through and I'm gonna harp on this a little bit more that um, there's a lot of information in this study area and it was a little overwhelming. Uh, but as we you know, moved through this initial kind of windshield survey and then a literature search, we, we got into more of an in-depth and detailed accounting of exactly what kinds of resources were present in this study area. What are the kinds of um, buildings and other, other features in the built environment that this context would likely need to explain um, for future survey work? And just as an example of that, I have um, the intersection of I-94 and Lexington Avenue highlighted here, um, just to illustrate, you know, in one very small area, the, the layers of history that we're seeing. Um, because at this intersection we have, you know, neighborhood history, this is the west edge of Rondo, um, and so there is a very complex history there to discuss. Also, um, the history of the black community in St. Paul and in um, the study area in general, and I would like to just shout out this fantastic image from the, the Minnesota Historical Society's collections that I use whenever I can of uh, women having a great time at a social club dance. Um, there's also educational history at this intersection, both public, uh, public schools with the, the Central High School building, but also with Catholic schools. Um, and you know, associated with that Catholic school is a Catholic church. We're going to need to explain um, the context of, of places of worship in this study area. Um, there's also a large you know, rec center, um, uh, the Jimmy Lee Rec Center there. So you know, again, entertainment and recreation providing another layer. And then threading through all of this is how, how did that interstate construction um, impact the built environment of this area and impact all of these different layers. And each spot in this study area is gonna have a different constellation. And so through, through all of this work, through all of this planning and thinking at the beginning of this historic context, our eyes were just getting bigger and bigger. More questions were coming, um, we were, figuring out um, or finding different resources that may come up in future survey, and that was always in our mind, that eventually this historic context is going to have to be useful for someone going out and doing survey work for whatever the Rethinking I-94 project eventually becomes once there is an alternative decided upon. Um, and so we took that very seriously, but we want to set up our colleagues in the future for good work, um, and we want to make sure that this is as usable and as relevant for them as possible. Um, but we were also confined by this, this kind of strange caterpillar of a study area. Um, and we recognized early on that there are resource types and there are community histories that just don't show up in this area in enough concentration to warrant the development of a, of a uh, historic context. Um, and so for an example, the, the Hispanic community in St. Paul their historic center has been in West St. Paul, kind of south of the river. Um, that community doesn't show up as much in this study area, and so they unfortunately don't, are then not reflected in the, the historic context we produce. So I don't want to give the false impression that this is an end-all, be-all historic context of Minneapolis and St. Paul. As Elizabeth mentioned, we were really um, focused on this specific study area. Um, and so after all of that thinking and after a lot of kind of panicked conference calls and Zoom calls, um, we wanted to look for someone else who had done something like this. We needed an example to try and you know, eat this whale. Um, and I luckily attended a webinar. There are uses for webinars um, where um, someone from the Survey LA, LA project where was talking about their um, really groundbreaking historic context study and that became the kind of example that we followed and what we found really useful about the work that Survey LA and the Los Angeles City Planning uh, Department has done is that they broke, again, a very diverse um, community history, a very layered and rich um, historic context down into individual chapters. Um, a lot of theirs are arranged on themes or on resource types and so that gave us a really great model to start thinking about how could we apply some sort of framework like this to our study, which is equally as complex and diverse as the resources that they were looking at out in California. So we started, again, going back through our, our survey area and trying to identify what our potential chapters could be. Um, and we figured out pretty early on that they were falling into two buckets, one that is very place-based um, and centers around neighborhood histories, 
and one that is more thematic and stretches across the entire survey area. Um, and so these, these two categories are what we um, worked with just to try and organize this uh, historic context into separate standalone chapters. And again, that was with an emphasis on future usability. Um, so our goal of this historic context and breaking it down into chapters like this was that so a future surveyor, a future historian who is, for example, trying to evaluate the Revo high rise um, at the east end of our study area could pull the Summit University chapter and could pull the urban renewal chapter, read those without having to read a thousand pages um, and have a good understanding of the historic context around this specific resource that they are trying to evaluate. So now I'm gonna walk you through the table of contents to see how this actually came uh, into being. So as Elizabeth talked about at the beginning, we have a front matter section that is really we felt was very important because as you can tell, we spent a lot of time thinking and a lot of time talking before we actually got into the writing. Um, and so this introduction section outlines our general approach um, to this project so that readers know what they're getting um, and our methodology and also is a, a guide for how to use it. We understand that this is going to be a very big thing um, to try and navigate as a reader, and so we included executive summaries of each of the individual chapters so that a future person could read through that and be like, oh yes, okay, so I know where I need to go. Um, we also included you know, baseline kind of introductory information about the National Register of Historic Places and traditional cultural properties in that front matter section to again lay that foundation for future survey work. And then once we got into the actual context, um, we did, had a lot of discussion about this, but eventually decided to include transportation at the beginning because that is the layer that underpins this, the entire reason for this project is understanding the transportation history of this corridor. And we really felt that it was important not, for that not to get lost in the mix. Um, and so therefore it goes in the, the coveted number three spot at the top of our section. Um, and another shout out to, to Sebastian in our office here for generating some really wonderful maps um, that hopefully when this goes live, you can uh, read and appreciate in our historic contexts. So using our, our kind of two place and theme buckets, um, we separated our, our document into, into two similar sections, um, grouping all of the historic contexts together. Um, and you can see a list there of all the neighborhoods that this uh, study area intersects um, as part of structuring those individual contexts, we really wanted them to be as uniform as possible, again, for usability, um, so that people know what they're um, likely to find in those neighborhood historic contexts. And so each of them starts with a map showing the neighborhood boundaries, current neighborhood boundaries, with an overlay of our study area, um, so that it's very clear from the beginning what resources we're trying to explain, um, and also to show graphically how much of a neighborhood is actually in this study area. For some of them, it's just a little slice at the bottom, um, and then a whole lot of neighborhood at the top. Um, we did want our historic context of the neighborhoods to, to tell that full story, as Katie was saying before. We're not just trying to explain the potential resources that are in yellow, in the yellow study area, because of course nothing happens in a vacuum, and these, neighborhoods and the, the development of the resources that are in um, that yellow study area, they're all part of the same story and it's important to understand that bigger context and not try and put resources into isolation. We also, in this process, had some points where we had to be really creative. Um, as we were working on, on these neighborhood studies, we came in with the idea that we would just use current neighborhood boundaries and it would be clean and easy. Um, and we started studying the, the kind of tangled mess of neighborhoods at the west end of our study area in Minneapolis um, where we have you know, Ventura Village and um, Elliott Park and a, kind of a couple of others. And we figured out pretty quickly that those neighborhood boundaries are very recent. Um, and so trying to tell the you know, late 19th century and early 20th century story of those neighborhoods, forcing them into these very modern boundaries was not working well. Um, and so we talked with CRU, we decided that this area's history before the interstate really deserves its own context, that it was one more unified neighborhood 
um, before the construction of I-94, 35W, and 55. Um, and so we decided, as you'll notice in the table of context, that we have a Minneapolis neighborhoods before the interstate chapter, um, which is how we decided to most effectively address that history. <coughs> And then our second batch of context was the, the thematic contexts, um, those contexts that are covering more of the entire study area, not just one neighborhood. You can see a list of them here. And this is one of the areas where we were addressing a lot of the gaps that we saw in previous, um, previous studies of the Twin Cities, Minnesota, this study area. A lot of more thematic context that we use a lot in our, in our work. Um, they end early, they're pretty thin, um, they don't include a lot of BIPOC community history or LGBTQIA 2S plus history. Um, some resources also like healthcare and medicine, historic hospitals, that can be tricky to find more robust context information about that's you know, locally based. Um, and so, speaking for myself, this is where I had the most fun as a historian, was researching these themes that are seen across the study area. And like I mentioned, uh, we wanted to address some pretty um, significant gaps with this study because we were trying to bring it up to the present day. Um, a lot of the existing information covers the late 1800s and early 1900s really well. Um, but a lot of those historic contexts have a pretty hard stop at World War II. And so post-war resources, urban renewal resources, even more recent um, building types and resource types don't have the framework to understand them. And so because this historic context is going to set up future survey work, we really needed to address that, that post-war gap. Um, and as my other presenters have mentioned, we also felt um, very strongly about covering BIPOC community history and LGBTQIA 2S plus community history, um, specifically for the communities that are, are really strongly represented in this study area. So now I'm gonna talk about a couple of, of fun ways that we, we got to dive into that. Um, so the, the post-war resources, we um, <coughs> found, had a lot of fun with this one. There's a lot of information uh, about urban renewal in the Twin Cities. Um, government programs love to document things, which is great. Um, <laughs> but it got a little bit overwhelming at times to try and read through the amount of information, the amount of primary sources in particular um, about these, these resources. Um, but the result was uh, you know, the urban renewal and the Summit University chapters in our historic context that really specifically focus on these more modern era resources to set up that, that future survey work and evaluation. And on the other hand, um, we also ran into some examples where resources were really thin. Um, and that, that is a really hard research challenge, especially when you're looking at communities of color um, and, and indigenous communities. In, in a lot of our work, we love looking at the censuses. Um, you can get a lot of really great information about where people were living, um, the ethnicities of people, what they were doing, what kind of jobs they held from those census records. But what we found when we were trying to research the American Indian community in this historic context was that we could not rely on those, those census records to identify what areas um, American Indian people were living in in, in highest numbers. Um, and that's because the census takers made assumptions a lot. They would put down what they thought um, somebody's race was without asking. And so we couldn't rely on that data to accurately map um, where people were living and what resources might be associated with this community history. Um, what are the, uh, res uh, excuse me, what Sebastian in our office, um, who was the lead historian on this context, did um, with, to great success in my opinion, was to look at World War I and World War II draft cards, where people were self-identifying their race and ethnicity, and that was a much, um, had a much higher level of credibility to us as, as historians in, in, in our ability to understand where people were living um, and what they were doing at, at least a couple of points in time. And that helped really to flesh out um, this historic context that I think was very successful. Thanks, 
All right, I'm the closer. Uh, what's next? How are we gonna utilize this? We've been talking a lot about the usefulness of this context going forward. From a project perspective, I think we're well set, right? We're gonna, we've got these really great contexts, they go up to more of a present day, so that when MnDOT ultimately chooses a preferred alternative, moves into tier two and project specific development along the corridor, for example, um, they're gonna do interchange improvements at 280, or they're going to um, improve a frontage road along the interstate because of some reason. We're able to then walk into that project, pull those contexts, open them up, start looking at what are the resources within the area, what's the history of this. We can utilize these contexts to help do our evaluations and our assessments of effect. But they're not static documents, right? This isn't the end of these contexts. As we start working in these specific project areas, we're gonna open them up and we're gonna do a little more public engagement. We're gonna do a little bit more research. We're gonna pull in the resources that we're seeing within that, that specific project area as potentially good examples of a particular property type or you know, um, from a Criterion A perspective, showing the story of you know, entertainment and recreation. And we'll add that detail back into the context. So from a project perspective, we feel pretty well set. But these contexts aren't just for us, right? They're really useful for communities too. City of St. Paul can pull a context if they want to because the neighborhoods aren't talked about just a little bit of it. We're talking about the entire neighborhood. HPC staff, CLG staff can pull this information and use it if they want to. Advocacy organizations can pull this context information and use it if they want to. A person, just a citizen in, in, in the you know, Seward neighborhood can pull this context and just learn about their neighborhood. So these just aren't for us and my unit and my staff and the future projects, they're for all of Minneapolis St. Paul residents you know, within the study area. There are a couple of other takeaways and, and things that we'll use moving forward. So very specifically, these contexts are focused on Minneapolis and St. Paul. But it's got us thinking about, well, what are the broader contexts of urban renewal within the state of Minnesota? So we're, we're using these contexts in many ways as a springboard for future work and future context development. Like our unit this year is starting a multi-year study of urban renewal within Minnesota. And we're using some of the data here to help us understand what is that larger story that's being told. And we're gonna use those contexts because they're helpful. We don't do just projects in Minneapolis-St. Paul, right? We do projects in Morris, we do projects up north, we do projects south, we do projects in Mankato. So as we develop these more project-specific historic contexts, we can think about them more broadly and transfer some of that knowledge into a broader context for the entire state. So I think this is a really great effort. It's really robust, it's really comprehensive, but the reality is MnDOT can't do this all the time. So I wanna be transparent and clear. We did this for I-94 because it's a very complicated, complex, many, many, many year process. And we needed a good framework for my staff in the future and for historians in the future. And that's why we went to this ex you know, extreme, very large, robust context. So we can't do this everywhere, we can't do it for every single project, we can't do it for mill and overlays, we can't do it for sidewalk replacement. But what we can do, some of the things that we've learned, is we can always take our context up more into the present day. So if I'm doing a smaller project context in a, a smaller community, I can still take that history and ask my consultants to bring that information up to 2023, 2025, whatever the year is, and have a better understanding and sense of, of change over time. So that's something we're implementing within our unit, so it's a good lesson learned out of this. Also, another lesson learned is pre prepare for challenges like COVID, right? All of our research repositories all of a sudden shut down or had very limited time to go, so our historians were going like one at a time every day to the Gale Family Library at the Historical Center and spending an hour looking, because that's all of the slot, the time slot that you got to sit by yourself in a, you know, this vast library. Mm -hmm. So give yourself time, you know, if it's a very large context, expect the unexpected, expect to pivot, like, like Hess Rice had to do with, you know, noticing that the, 
neighborhoods before the interstate were very different than the neighborhoods after the interstate, and having that, being able to build that within your scope of work if you're, you know, an agency that actually, you know, goes out for, for contract on this. If you're a historian or a researcher, make sure that you've got a lot of chance to, you know, sit down with the, the information you have, pull in the community as much as you can, have an ethnographer or someone that really understands the, the larger, broader population and how to talk about things. So lots of things we've learned in this process, lots of things that we'll take forward. We um, are wrapping up the historic context. They're done, but they're going through ADA review. So anything you post to MnDOT has to be ADA accessible, which is great, um, but it takes time to do that. So we've got the, the context all ready to go. They're gonna be posted here probably in the next month at the Rethinking I-94 website. Um, and then also, one of the things that we did as part of this project is because these contexts are so large, the transportation context is like 80 pages long, um, we broke down some of the data into a one-pager. So we have, we call them teaser documents that are available that um, the NEPA team, the Metro NEPA team can then take those, those pieces of information out to the public and say, hey, there's this, you know, great context out there. We're not going to print all 80 pages of it. You can go find it on the website, but if you're interested in learning more, here's a one-page piece of information that talks about the boundaries, that talk about some of the key facts out of the, the historic context. If you're really, really interested, go see the larger, broader study that's, that's available. So all 1,000 pages are gonna be up on our website, the Metro's website for Rethinking I-84, um, and all of those one-pagers will also be available to the public. So we're really excited to, to launch this and get it out to everybody. We were hoping it'd be done by by the time for this presentation, but it's not quite there yet. Things move slowly. Um, yeah, so we're moving on to questions, but I did want to just throw one thing out there. We didn't talk about archaeology at all, right? This is an architecture history study. We did a separate archaeology study, historic context for the study area for archaeology. I don't want to, you know, say that we didn't. It's got sensitive information in it, so it won't be posted to the public website, but it is available for our use in the future for project work. So with that, any questions about what we did, how we did it, and what we're going to do with it? Yeah? I'm curious. The 50s and 60s were defined more by what I would call grand gesture racism, right? Running the freeway through, deliberately through Hansa, all right? And that's an easy, uh, very easy historic uh, you know, that we see. Uh, but, the eight, but the 80s and 90s were more defined by what I would call death by a thousand cuts racism. Where, so it, where early on the cities, municipalities, and the high, and highway departments would work to you know, run the freeway to Rondo. Now they're not necessarily doing that type of thing. But in the 80s and 90s, it was more like as they rebuilt and added things, it was more like denying things for neighborhoods that were having more work, uh, more efforts to listen to wealthier neighborhoods. Um, and, uh, you know, access, you know, freeway access um, being designed in a sense to deliberately cut off certain things and features within a poor neighborhood or, or different with a wealthy neighborhood. Um, I'm curious about whether or not that was included in the context, because it does seem it's more about grand gesture racism than it is about the 80s and 90s and what, like, what areas were you looking at? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm going to start, but then I don't know if, Liz or Rachel, you want to take it. So in, in terms of the, the transportation history, um, it, it, the large amount of the work that was done was in the late 60s, right, in, in this area. And there weren't as many smaller projects happening. And at the junction of the, you know, the I-94 is being built, and very, very soon after, 280 is being built right through, through there. So from a transportation perspective, the, the need to come in and do more work was less, and we didn't get necessarily into more project-specific things that MnDOT did in like the 90s or you know the 80s. Um, and, and in large part, I think it's that there not a lot was happening along these corridors as in terms of improvements that were being made. Now that, that's just to talk about this specific area. You know, outstate there are these situations happening, but since we were focused really on just this piece and the and the movement and change over time. Um, we didn't get into the specificity that you're talking about. Was there any discussion, like, was working with uh, neighborhood groups along the corridors, or working with the documents with, from the groups? 
Yeah, yep, and I don't know if Liz, you wanna, Liz or Rachel, you wanna talk to that specific sure. engagement effort. Working with oh. neighborhood groups along the corner. Yeah. Public engagement, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yes, that was part of the public engagement process was reaching out. Um, the, and I apologize again, the, the scope of this was very large and trying to compact into this presentation, but we did come up with uh, a list of consulting parties, but then also a list of public organizations and social groups along the corridor that was at least five to six pages long. And they were, every single group was contacted and included, and I do want to just make sure we include in this work all the federally recognized tribes as well for the state. So uh, communities were contacted, uh, virtual interviews were set up with those who responded. Not everybody responded, but as Katie mentioned, we recognize that as this context is applied, there will be additional public engagement that's more specific to an area. So what we did do, um, besides including interview information that was gathered, survey information that was gathered from our public engagement process, was rely a lot upon um, oral histories that were available to try to include documentation of what people have said in their own words about their communities or about what is valuable to them. And again, recognizing that hopefully this document will continue to grow in a way by taking in more specific information as Mendette focuses on other areas. I also forgot to mention, I'm really quick before I address your question, sir. Um, included with at the end of each chapter are criteria for evaluation, um, which is a, a key part of, of course, being able to use this context and apply it to a survey. Um, and then another thing about, a little bit about logistics. Um, so Hess Royce was the prime, we are a women owned business. So we had about 60% of the writing meet and hunt had approximately 40%. We divided up the areas by chapters. So Meet and Hunt did specific neighborhoods. We did the other neighborhoods. Meet and Hunt covered some of the themes. We covered the other themes. Sir? Yeah, uh, if I heard you right, you said we used a bulk of the your survey was done more of like late 60s? Well, not survey. So for your interview information gathering. Well, we looked at everything that we could find in, um, for example, Minnesota Historical Society uh, when it came to oral histories that were available. Um, Katie was mentioning earlier about transportation, that the I-94 construction in the 1960s was um, a huge part of that chapter on transportation. But, um, and I would have throw this over to Rachel, who worked on the um, Black History section, your information went to the more recent. Yes. Correct. I, I would like to sort of follow up on that. I would like to encourage you to look back, look further back, to in the 50s, even as far back as late 40s. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm sure a lot of people here know about that the state of Minnesota is very deficient in how the recorded history in this state. So one rely, relying mostly on recorded history, things from the museums here is very lacking, is, is very, very complete. Uh, it will do a lot of justice if you guys um, in your reaching out to different organizations to specifically reach out to uh, many communities of color, and get the information directly from them. And these are things you cannot find in many institutions here in this state. Thank you for that comment. And I, I do want Rachel to talk a little bit about the scope, for example, of the chapter she worked on. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify there that the, the context, each context does span the entire temporal boundary that we were looking at. So all of them start with pre-settler colonial settlement going through the present day. So even though the interstate construction is really focused on that, you know, planning and, and construction efforts in the 50s and 60s, our historic context are covering a much broader period of time. Um, and especially when we were researching communities of color, your point is very well taken, sir. It's really hard to find resources. And we are very lucky that the, um, the spokesman and recorder archives have been recently digitized. Uh, those are black owned and black produced newspapers in the Twin Cities and that was really valuable 
for us to be able to get um, more community produced information, especially from earlier time periods where we don't have people around anymore to talk to. Um, we did do a lot of public engagement within the, the black community and folks were trying to remember things that their, you know, their parents told them about the, the corridor before the interstate. Um, but we are in a little bit of a, a, a tricky um, spot in terms of the, the folks are still around to provide those oral histories and that's why earlier efforts that are, are held at the Minnesota Historical Society um, and there have been a few books of collections of different oral history interviews from those older generations that have now passed are really, really valuable resources to understanding that earlier history. Other questions? Yes? Can you tell us the website that your study is on? <laughs> yes, good question. So if, if you were just to Google the Rethinking I-94 MnDOT webpage, it will take you to the larger project Web page for Metro District that has it. Our study is going to be on that web page. It is not yet posted, but it will be probably by the end of October. Yeah. It's on a platform called Let's Talk Transportation. Uh, so if you see that in the title, that'll be it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, she didn't. Oh, 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 sorry. sorry. Yep. So if you if, if you see the Let's Talk Transportation at the on the web page, that's the right one you're going to. There are a lot of rethinking I-94 web pages out there because of other advocacy organizations and things talking about I-94 and rethinking I-94. But you you want to make sure that it's got MnDOT on there and Let's Talk Transportation, and it should link you to the right place. And I don't know if Shippa would be willing to send out an email blast for us if once we got that up there, because I'm pretty sure you guys are all on there. There's a question over yes, here. Yes, that sounds lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. I saw Amy nod. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. <laughs> yep. um, what's the broader context for improvements to I-94? Is there, like, is this a five-year timeline, ten-year timeline? Where is it, where is the project going? Yep, good question. So they're right now it, in this scoping effort, the, the project team is developing all sorts of different potential ideas for within the corridor, within the trench itself. I, I say the word trench, actually only a small portion of I-94 is actually in a trench, so um, within the corridor, they're, they're thinking about all sorts of different things um, from just like improving like crack repair, that kind of really low level, all the way up to, you know, filling the whole thing in. So they're looking at all sorts of different things. They won't have chosen alternatives that they want to move further into the NEPA process until I think next year, around this time. And then at that point, we will know more about what are the actual more specific things they're thinking of doing. Um, and then from there, once those alternatives are collected, so right now, just broad ideas, They'll, they'll narrow it down to a set of alternatives that they want to take further into the NEPA process. And then from there, once they start really vetting those particular alternatives, they will come up with one or two chosen alternatives that actually become projects in the more formal sense. The timeline for that right now, I'm, I'm thinking 2027 before they actually have something that they know that they're going to do and how that's going to move through you know, federal processing and funding and, and everything. And then from there, once you've got those, then they break the project down into smaller bits. So they'll do a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit there. I, I don't think at any time they're going to do the entire corridor in one full length of thing. So we're thinking that you know, it's a, probably a 20-year project total overall or more, which is why we wanted our context to really move forward in time to help us. That's a good question. And all of that sort of tiered NEPA, all of those crazy words that we're using up here, that is explained on that Let's Talk Rethinking I-94 page about where they are. And you can, you can throw your own comments into there if you want to. Anything else? Well, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. A big shout out to Hess Royce, Mead and Hunt, Land Relations, and Associates. We tasked them with a very, very big thing, and they did a very good job helping us collect and gather this information for us and for you guys. Thank you.